two of these tools together. Uh, some of you may be familiar, especially those of you who were on last week's webinar with uh, some of the tools we showed you, uh, a lot of them focused on campaign finance uh, records. Um, what's different about the two tools we are showing you today is that uh, these are databases that we in some uh, respects build in-house. Um, not completely in the case of political absolutes, but uh, definitely from scratch in the, in the case of political party time. And so these are collaborative reporting tools in the sense that these are tools that you can both use and help us improve. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about them one at a time, but just generally what we're talking about here are our database party time is a database of political fundraisers. Um, this is money that probably will eventually show up in Federal Election Commission reports, but we think these fundraisers are important to catalog in and of themselves for several reasons. Uh, one is money porn. We all like to see how the other half lives, and uh, a lot of times the invitations for these fundraisers and the uh, accounts of these fundraisers include a lot of details uh, that underscore the fact that uh, the rich are indeed different and uh, operate in different ways. But more substantively, um, if you can afford to write a big check for a fundraiser, uh, you are buying access. The people who go to political fundraisers get to have uh, considerable face time with the politicians uh, who are there, and we think it's important to record that. Thirdly, and this is the reason we like to get invitations whenever possible, uh, the hosts of the fundraisers are often lobbyists or movers and shakers in their communities. And the fact that they are essentially bundling money, what they're doing by hosting a fundraiser is tapping into their networks of relationships to get to put together buckets of money that are more than they could legally give themselves mm -hmm. to a candidate. And that, of course, is a way of ingratiating yourself uh, and ex exponentially with the candidate. So we like to get those details and put them in a database. Um, and we do it. We think it's a great tool for reporters, but our database is only as good as the information we get. So we really urge you, and um, Palmer will talk a little bit more about this, to tell us about the fundraisers that you hear about or write about, and we'll show you how to do that. The second database uh, is Political Ad Sleuth, which we started in 2010, we'll tell you, or, or 2012, I'm sorry, it was in response to the 2010 uh, Citizens United ruling, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But this consolidates um, the ad buys, the actual contracts and invoices for political ad buys around the country. There's a lot of information in these uh, documents that um, can be incredibly useful to reporters who are covering campaigns or activists who are following campaigns. Uh, but again, because of the way uh, this stuff is filed, the data will become more useful if we can get people to help us enter some of it into a more structured database. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So these are, uh, I would say, interactive reporting tools because a little bit of, uh, if you give them a little bit of TLC, uh, they'll pay you back over and over again. And uh, we hope that you'll be uh, using them and also partnering with us in improving them. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Palmer, who is the queen of party time, to tell you a little bit about this uh, database and how we use it and how we build it. Well, thank you for that introduction, Kathy. Um, I would love to be the queen of party time. Um, so let's see. One of the one of the things that's so powerful about party time is that it's really kind of a and it it shows early on influence. As Kathy was mentioning just a few minutes ago, you know, it shows who's throwing these parties, who's offering up their lobbying shops um, to to host parties at their actual um, at their actual uh, you know um, lobbying lobbying um, offices and things. Um, and sometimes at their fancy townhouses too, or restaurants. <laughs> Yeah, excellent, excellent point. Um, so I'm I'm putting up here um, the party time uh, a page on the party time uh, site. Hopefully you all can see it now. Um, 
but we really think that this is a great early kind of early warning system, and it adds in great details, you know, for uh, folks while they're reporting, um, you know, especially folks who are reporting kind of um, on a on a local from local papers, you know. So, for example, you're say a Kentucky paper, and you're writing about the Senate race going on between Mitch McConnell and Alice Lundergan Grimes, and you know, you're covering what the, everybody's saying on the trail, um, you know, what's going on at campaign rallies and things. But if you um, you know, use our our tool here with Party Time. You can see where um, Allison Lunderkin Grimes um, is actually, you know, where she's actually doing, a, you know, having a lot of her political fundraisers, where she's having a lot of her parties. So you can see, um, I know these top two recent ones here are in Kentucky, but you can see that for a while there, earlier in June and um, earlier this year, she was fundraising in D.C., New York, Ohio, Atherton, California, a very, very wealthy part of California, um, at, up in Chicago, over in Florida. So you can really see where she's currying favor, um, that it isn't just from, you know, she's not just, as we like to say, partying with Kentucky donors. She's also partying with, um, with folks who are, folks who are um, in, outside of her state. So um, the Party Time database, we go ahead and uh, digitize the info from, that we get from Fundraiser Insights, and we make it into, obviously, into the data so that we can then sift through and look for patterns and trends and things. So um, one of the ways that you can go ahead and do that is our website is politicalpartytime.org. I probably should have said that at the outset. I apologize for that. Um, but it is politicalpartytime.org, and this is um, just kind of what the top part of the site looks like. Um, and if you go over to our um, data slash API um, button there, you can go ahead and download all of the data that we've, hand, uh, that we've hand entered from these fundraisers. So as I said, we digitize the information from those fundraiser invites. So as you scroll down here. And we should say, as you're waiting, you're waiting on your screen, um, the data that you download will come to you in a spreadsheet. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Excel spreadsheets, uh, you then can sort, filter, uh, do whatever you want. We've done some fun things that I think you'll see later uh, using that data to map fundraisers and, uh, and create other graphics. So you can have lots and lots of fun with this. And we'll show you some inspirational examples in a bit. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, just like I said, under that, um, it's politicalpartytime.org slash API. And you can see we, we just have all of um, these different options for how you can download your data. But at the very bottom there, there's an option to download a CSV file. And you can go ahead and then you know, do all your sorts and filters and tallies and counts and all of that kind of stuff. Um, again, that's on the data page on our site. So the, some of the different ways that um, you, know, you can look at, um, look, at, look at our site to get story ideas and things are to just look at the um, calendar. And I'm sorry, it looks like our connection is just a little bit slow there. Um, but uh, every week you know, we have you know, a, a weekly calendar, so you can see that this week is a particularly busy week. And so this also this gives you a great you know overview of what different you know what weeks look like. So for example, this is a, a very very busy week even for political party time. Um, but you know it's also interesting to see when you kind of compare it with some of the other schedules that are going on outside of um, outside of traditional fundraising. So for example, if we look at the week of April 13th to April 19th, that was the beginning of kind of the spring break for Congress, and you'll see. We've got nothing. <laughs> We've got nothing. We've got a really empty week. But then, after the two-week break, there we go, you can see that we've got a much fuller calendar. So it can be interesting. I know that's a really simple way, but it can be really interesting to just look at our calendar page and kind of see the ebb and flow of activity um, based on where Congress is and what they're doing. So. This, this week that I'm showing you right now, April 27th to May 3rd, 2014, this was the first week that Congress was back in D.C. after 
their, their spring break. And you can see, just with a quick look over the calendar here, you can see how many um, events were happening in the District of Columbia. So, you know, a lot of times Congress members go and they, they go to the Hill and then they quickly do a luncheon fundraiser or things. We can see a lot of that really easily on the calendar. Paula, there's a quick question online um, wondering if this tool only compiles data for federal candidates. Um, yes and no. Um, we like to, we ideally have everything um, on uh, for federal candidates, absolutely. But there are some state candidates who we, who we do have, um, who we do have included in there, as well as some um, gubernatorial candidates. So think about somebody like um, Governor O'Malley or Chris Christie. Those are going to be real national players, and they, um, frankly, they just pop up a lot kind of on our radar in terms of fundraisers. And I, um, I'll just say that um, we will take uh, whatever we we try to do, we try to make this a comprehensive mm -hmm. as at, this is the most comprehensive fundraising database that exists for fundraisers, but it is not comprehensive. Uh, we only know what we know, and I'm sure we're only getting the tip of the iceberg. That's why uh, we really are reaching out to people and asking people to let us know about fundraisers. Um, we will take whatever fundraising info you can get. I personally would like to see us uh, get more and more outside the Beltway uh, fundraisers and outside the Beltway candidates because, uh, as you might recall, uh, the current President of the United States used to be a state legislator. So I think having a, a lengthy record of all of uh, somebody's IOUs is very interesting. So we do not turn up our noses at any fundraising in, uh, invitation we get. We get it, we'll enter it. That's 100% that's true. And if I may actually just piggyback on that just a little bit more, um, there's a really great example this week um, about um, Eric Lesser, who is having um, a fundraiser in Washington, D.C. He was one of uh, President Obama's early um, kind of recruits in New Hampshire, started out in 2007 um, on, on Team Obama. And, you know, look at what we have here. We've got a, a fundraiser happening just this week in Washington, D.C. He's running for state senate in western Massachusetts, which is where he's from originally. And you can see here on the invite, I know it's kind of small for you guys. Um, oops, sorry about that. Um, but you can see here on the invite, we've got a whole bunch of hosts listed, and that first one is David Axelrod. I <laughs> don't know if you've heard of him, but <laughs> um, he's, a, he's a big player in the uh, Obama administration, or was a big player in the Obama administration and campaigns and the Clinton world as well. So we can see a lot of these connections. Um, and then if you kind of scroll up there, you can see that we've, again, digitized all that information so that if you want to click through here and see who else is David Axelrod hosted for, you can click on that name right there and see. And this becomes useful later on because say Eric Lesser eventually, uh, who used to be literally a bag man for Obama, he was in charge of the, um, the baggage on the uh, Obama 08 campaign, um, campaign plane. Uh, but if Eric were to become uh, a senator and one of the people on this host list is, uh, ends up lobbying for a bill, it would be very useful for you as a reporter to know that uh, U.S. Senator Lesser is uh, responding to somebody who was one of his earliest supporters. So that's why having this kind of detailed information is interesting. It's not just interesting in terms of the current fundraiser, but when you go back and try to connect the dots of influence when there's actual legislation on the floor. Exactly. So one of the ways that we can come up with some of these story ideas is to obviously, as I said, go through the calendar, or we can um, search for a specific, politi uh, specific politician. So for example, um, let's say I am a reporter in Nevada and Aaron Bilberry is running uh, for a House seat um, in Nevada. and. Um, if I type her name in here in the search bar just by typing in Bill Bray, that'll give me a list. And then I clicked through and found, um, and found this invite. Um, and so again, this is a good example of showing kind of who else she's connected with. We can see here, you know, it, it's, 
it's providing us um, it's providing us some of those anecdotes that are really important as we're trying to kind of fill out larger narratives on what's going on politically um, in you know as, as political reporters. So we see that obviously Democrats are really valuing this seat in um, in Nevada because they're sending Vice President Joe Biden there to kind of you know to headline this um, campaign rally and fundraiser that's happening in Las Vegas. So you can also um, search in this bar as well um, for a specific host. Another good example of that is going to be Jeffrey Katzenberg. Um, he hosts a bunch of different parties for a variety of Democratic candidates. So all that I did to get here was to just type in Katzenberg right there in the host. Um, and clicking through here, we can see, oh, he's hosted parties for Allison Lundergan Grimes, as well as Wendy Davis running in Texas. Um, and you can see, too, um, kind of the universe of connections that he'll bring to these parties. So it isn't just, oh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who um, you know, is a very well-known Hollywood, um, Hollywood heavy hitter, big player out in California. You know, he's also bringing Steven Spielberg here to this, you know, to this party. Or, um, you know, he's also, um, he's also brought um, Harvey Weinstein out for Allison Lundrick and Grimes up in New York. So you can really see kind of the universe, the kind of ripple effect of all of that. Um, and another good example um, is just kind of clicking on the calendar at a specific event um, for this week. So if I, um, uh, this week there's, a, there's an event happening for a Senate majority pack out in Seattle, um, actually later on today. Um, and here we've got this, um, this invite for it, and it shows, um, you know, it, it, it offers the, you know, the anecdotes of, you know, where it's happening, who's hosting it, um, you know, the time, all of that kind of stuff. But um, that, that all of those anecdotes that make for an interesting story, but it also provides some of the, you know, some of the data that, um, that provides some of the harder backing for some of these stories. So we can see if we click through here onto President Barack Obama, um, we'll see that this is certainly, and I know that this has been in the press a lot, but that this is certainly not his, the first fundraiser that he has headlined. Um, certainly recently, but we can go ahead and see how many. And if you download the data, you're able to do a lot of the, um, you know, sorts and filters and things that will allow you to see just exactly how many fundraisers he has headlined, um, you know, this year or, or this cycle or whatever, you know, you want to, whatever you want to look at. Um, so, you know, this collection of all of Obama's fundraisers and fundraiser appearances, this is the collection that we know about, as Kathy was mentioning before. Um, this is really, you know, what we've received from, from our sources, from um, different people who just upload invitations, but it's, it's also what we've, what we've found kind of out and about while, while hunting around for these invites. But, you know, local reporters, you guys, a lot of folks get these, um, get these invitations and they just kind of sit on your desk, the paper version of them. And what we really ask that you do is you can send them to us so that we can c compile them into a larger database so that, you know, there's a lot of power here to be able to see what exact, you know, how many, um, how many times Barack Obama has been to California. You know, it, it's, it's hard to make that tally if, you know, if you're a reporter down in L.A. and you want to know how many times he's been in the whole state, we really um, provide you with the ability to see, um, to make some of those larger, uh, larger statements. Um, and that's a perfect plug, as Kathy was saying before, to our um, upload feature, which is 100% confidential, I will say. This is under the contact button. Um, and you can go ahead and email us invitations. Um, we will take just about anything you've got. So if you've got official invites, or if you've got a news story, or if you've um, kind of heard some hot gossip, you've got a picture of the menu, anything like that, um, we will take all of that. You can send it to partytime at sunlightfoundation.com, or you can upload things right here using our upload feature. And everything is 100% confidential. We keep our sources um, 100% confidential, and so you don't have to uh, have that be a concern as you go ahead and, and share these things as well. 
but we're also always happy to give credit uh, to uh, friends of Sunlight so, and friends of Party Time if you uh, do want that. Uh, one thing I will say, uh, one other piece of information, even if we already have the fundraiser invite or some information on it, and uh, you go and cover the event and get a lot of color, we'd love to see that story, uh, and we'd love to add it. We're thinking, we're talking about in the back end finding ways to add those details to our database and eventually expose that so that that information will be available for everybody. Um, we also, one thing that I uh, would highly recommend, if you go to an event, uh, sometimes it may not be a fundraiser per se, but this happens a lot at, say, political conventions. And it's not necessarily just national conventions, but say if your state party is having a convention. Um, there are often hospitality suites and rooms around there. And when you walk in, there will be a big sign on an easel that will say, we want to thank our sponsors. And it's usually a big list of corporations take a picture of that and send it to us with whatever information you have about the event and politicians at the event because that fits into this rubric of people who are buying access. You know, there's nothing wrong with it, uh, but we think the public needs to know who is uh, buying the access and how much access they're getting so that uh, that the table, that the, you know, the field is evened out a little bit. So uh, please help us, and uh, we will tell you more if you have questions later. But right now, I'm going to move to tool number two, which is our political mm -hmm. ad sleuth. And uh, let me see if I can share my desktop with you. And I'm taking you to political ad sleuth, which is, uh, imaginatively enough, the URL is politicaladsleuth.com. And I hope you're seeing it up there. Uh, this is a website that compiles uh, all of the political ad buys uh, which are now filed to the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, we started this in 2012 before there were any electronic filings. Uh, while we were building the site, uh, the uh, Federal Communications Commission won a court battle which allowed us to get uh, some of this stuff electronically. And uh, in July, earlier this month, uh, the Federal Communications required, uh, Commission required all 2,000 plus broadcast TV stations in the country to begin uploading their political ad files online, which is terrific because, as some of you may know, uh, this is very useful information. And previously, the only way you could get this was by physically going to your local TV station and uh, getting inside and rifling through the files, which was, uh, needless to say, a very time-consuming process, and it was absolutely impossible under those circumstances to really connect the dots nationwide. So uh, this tool allows you to do that. Uh, we can type in uh, the name of a, an organization, like Crossroads GPS, and we can do a quick search in AdSleuth, and it will tell us uh, that we have 1,752 results. That does not mean ads. That means that we have 1,752 filings by Crossroads GPS. Uh, it starts back in August of 2012 when they, they, these uh, electronic filings were first required at some stations. And as of uh, July, we now have all of them. So uh, you can see very quickly by eyeballing this, uh, the TV markets in which uh, Crossroads has been advertising, and um, you get some idea of where they're present. We can filter this. We could just look at uh, filings in a particular state. Um, and we can also filter this by date. So if we just look at Ohio, we see 299 results. If we just want to look at the uh, current campaign cycle, we could start with uh, January 1, 2013. And of course, we are going to go all the way up to November 4th of this year. Why is that? Because one of the great advantages of this tool is that it's an early warning system. We see a lot of these buys are made well in advance of the ads actually airing. 
And um, if you were to look through this, you would find that there are a lot of ads that have already been purchased uh, all the way through uh, 2014. And you could look in your state, um, you could look in your particular TV market and, and find this. So this is great, right? Because uh, if you're in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and you know that Crossroads is advertising in Pittsburgh because you're watching TV, I'm mentioning Pittsburgh because that's my hometown, go Steelers, um, you could now want to say, well, what are they doing in Harrisburg? Or what are they doing in Philadelphia? And this allows you to look outside of your market and contextualize uh, what's happening in your neighborhood with what's happening elsewhere in the state or elsewhere in the country. So that's <coughs> what we do not have. And, and I will, b before I go into what we do not have, I will tell you another thing that we have here. And the reason, really, the inspiration for building this tool was Citizens United. Uh, as you know, uh, Citizens United in 2010 opened up um, the uh, the political system for a lot of uh, what we call dark money, uh, money that's given by groups like Crossroads GPS that are not registered as political committees with the Federal Election Commission. We don't know very much about their um, background in many cases. We don't know very much about their donors. But the one place they do have to leave a paper trail is the television stations where they buy advertisements. Now, we know who Crossroads GPS is. That group has been thoroughly investigated, and uh, we know about them. But what you're going to see, and I predict you will see a lot of it closer to the election, is what I call mystery meat committees, uh, buying ads in your uh, state or your city, uh, and they'll be called something like uh, Washingtonians for a Better Washington or um, Pennsylvanians for better cheesesteak. It's something anodyne that tells you, that makes you feel good. It's something we can all get behind, but it tells you nothing. And it could be your local PTA or it could be your local toxic waste dump. And we think it's really important for the voters to know who's delivering these messages so that they understand how they ought to interpret them. It's like, you know, it's something we know as reporters consider the source. And so we're trying to get to who the source is. In these records, you will find, you should find, a form that will identify the group placing the ad as well as it should, under law, they are required to identify a uh, principal or, and or a board of directors. Am I right about that, Jacob? Is it both? Um, and, uh, and so that is usually, those names are usually all you as a good local reporter need to start sussing out who these people are. Uh, who is this committee really? And uh, so you'll find that will be a great reporting tool for you. Um, so that's in here. What is not in here, right now, as you see this, is we're not seeing any numbers. We don't see uh, how much are they spending. Well, it's there, but we have to dig for it. So uh, what I'm going to do, what I want to do is look at a particular market. So uh, would somebody speak up, either in our chat room or um, unmute yourself, and just give us a market that you're interested in? First come, first serve. Denver, Colorado. All right, Denver, Colorado. So how are we going to find Denver, Colorado? We're going to go up to the top of the page, and we're going to click on Market Report. And this defaults to a page that tells us what's coming up in the week ahead, and it tells us what markets are hot. And we can go through, and there might be all kinds of reasons that those markets are hot, but, let's, but we want to find Denver. So I'm going to look under TV markets, and now I'm going to do a search for Denver. And there it is. So I'm going to open this market. Well, and while Kathy's doing that, I, I just want to point out that the market report is it's a sort of a crude measure of what's going on, but if you look at the top of that chart um, back on the market report page, it lists the number of documents we're seeing uh, coming in into to different races, to local races, to state races, to house races, to Senate races, um, and, and this sort of other, this kind of other, 
what is it called, non-candidates. Um, you know, these numbers are are not incredibly meaningful because sometimes you'll see you'll see uh, advertisers getting getting billed months after running their ad. But as a, as a crude measure, it often kind of gives you a sense of what's happening. So just looking at that, I can see that in in this market uh, in Wisconsin, um, you know, most of the action there is at the state level. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, in, in Davenport, Ohio, it looks like there's a house race, the state race, uh, there's Iowa, a bunch of, yeah. a bunch of uh, non-candidate ads going up. Um, so just kind of eyeballing this can often give you a sense of, of where the action is. Of course, if you live in that market or are familiar with it, you probably know this already. Um, but, but if you're looking at, at, at this from, from some distance, it can kind of help you interpret immediately what's going on. Okay, so now we'll go back to our market report, which is the full list of markets, not just what's hot. And we're going to uh, find Denver. I usually do a control find, um, and my computer's being slow, so bear with me. Um, and we are just going to look at uh, the ads in Denver. So there are two things you can click here. All stations, uh, which is underneath every market, will give you a list of stations. And you can, from there, just click on a particular station and uh, look at ads from, from that. And there's a reason you might want to do that, which we'll show you in a minute. But for now, we're going to look at Denver. I want to see all stations in Denver, Colorado. And so here we are. Uh, we're looking at a station, uh, we're looking at a bunch of stations in Denver, and we're looking at a bunch of ads. And you can see that by uh, simply eyeballing this data, um, you can tell a lot about what groups are active in the, uh, in the market. And uh, we can see that people, uh, Cory Gardner, who's a Republican candidate for Senate, has been buying some ads. But there are a lot of these non-candidate issue ads. This data that we're seeing here, this information, is, as, is what's put on the uh, file as it goes into the Federal Communications Commission. So it's a little, you know, it's, a, it's inconsistent. Uh, the FCC is pretty liberal about uh, allowing the, the TV stations to upload things as they want. So we're going to click on this uh, first file, and we are going to open up a page that will allow us to see what we've got. This is our data entry page. And what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to open the original document. And I'm going to just walk through my, work, uh, my workflow. Uh, you may find a better workflow for you. But I want to see, I want to know this, total spent. And I want to know this. I want to know how many ad spots did they get. So in order to do that, I'm going to control click and open in a new tab the original document. And it says it's not found. And that's actually a good thing to do because sometimes you will get this. And uh, what, it's, what it means is that uh, that document has probably been loaded. I'm going to try it again. But um, it may have been taken down by the station. Uh, it means that there may be a duplicate document filed. Um, there are lots of reasons for this. If you see a bunch of them, uh, let us know. But uh, just know that this sometimes happens. And what I would do in this case is to move on. So let's take another look here. Again, I'm going to control click so I can come back to my original list. I'm now going to open that page, which is the data entry page. And now I'm going to open the original document. Oops, and I didn't mean to download that. I'm going to control click. And for whatever reason, it's a, spreadsheet. it's a spreadsheet. So that's actually a good thing. Um, so that's atypical, but um, this group is entering a spreadsheet, um, which is actually the way we'd like people to file this data, because it would be much easier for us to um, enter it and compute with it. Um, of what we can take a look at it. And uh, there you have a contract. Um, so uh, we will enter this data. And uh, I'm going to show you that uh, 
this is actually, it looks to me like this is the uh, sheet that I was describing to you. Um, this is uh, telling us who the group is. The, it's kind of weirdly filled out here. It says issue, but the, this is actually the buyer, the Environmental mm. Defense Action Fund. This is telling you that they are putting an ad on that mentions Cory Gardner. He's a candidate for Senate. And here we have the contact information for this group. Um, so uh, that is useful information for reporting. And you can imagine that if this group were called Coloradans for Better Colorado, you would want to start looking up the names of these people and figuring out who was who. So what I'm going to do for the purposes of this, this is not a contract, I'm going to enter this ad data. So now I'm going to press this button that says Enter Ad Data. And uh, what this will mean is that um, you're going to uh, get a page up here, and it will ask you when you first do this for login information. Uh, I'm already logged in, or should be, um, and it will give me a form to fill out. Uh, when, you, you can, when you log in, you can do it any way you want. You can create your own user, username and a, and a password. If you're absent-minded like me, you can log in with Facebook or Twitter. Trust me, we don't sell your data. We're a nonprofit. Uh, the only reason we do this is, as I'm sure you all can appreciate being reporters, uh, politics can sometimes attract people who want to game the system. We want to keep our system honest and pure, and if we find out somebody's gaming the system, we need to be able to uh, keep them off of it. Uh, we want the data to enter, enter to be accurate. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to enter this data and I'm going to say, first of all, I'm going to click this. This isn't an ad buy. This is not a buy. It's not a contract. But it is interesting information, so I'm going to enter who bought it. And now you can see I've started entering. We already have them in our system, the Environmental Defense Fund. So I'm just going to click on that. I'm not going to enter a contract number because this is not a contract. I'm not going to enter the flight start date, which if this were a contract would be the date of actual airing, or the total amount spent or number of spots. I'm going to instead scroll down here. This is a field we can fill in, uh, looking at our spreadsheet, the media buyer, which can be interesting information. And in this case, it's Canal Partners. And there you see we already have them in the system. And here un under Data Entry Notes, I'm going to say this is a form that identifies the advertiser and principles. So that means that if you download a spreadsheet of our data, which you can do from this site, um, and you're looking for Environmental Defense Fund and you're wondering who the hell are these people, um, you know that this is the form you need to look at. And now I'm going to submit that data and uh, it will be available to you and any other reporter who needs to use this uh, downloadable on a spreadsheet. Um, so now I can go back and continuing, continue entering this data. So I'm going to try to find a contract for you so we can uh, look at uh, what, what they look like. Oh, and that's going to be an NAB form, which is basically what we just look, looked at. Um, but once you enter this data, uh, it will be visible. You'll be able to see under these columns how many spots, the cost. And um, for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, just show you a market where we've done a lot of this. And you can actually see. We have a group of volunteers in Philadelphia who are um, – entering advertisements, so I'm going to show you what it looks like when the ads, ad data has been entered. And here's Philadelphia. And let's see how busy our beavers have been. <laughs> Here you go. Um, once a, a document has been looked at by somebody and entered, it's going to show up as summarized. 
Um, so the document I just entered would say summarize, but it wouldn't have this number beside it because it wasn't a contract. But here you can see that Tom Corbett bought 10 spots for $8,750. Um, so, and further down you can see the National Republican Congressional Committee, because it's an outside group, has to pay more for its ads. Uh, and they have purchased 24 spots for $29,700. So, um, so this, the bottom line is this is a database that um, can give you a lot uh, for very little work, but it can also, uh, if you put something into it, it can give you back even more. You can start to compute and add up how much different groups have uh, put into advertising in your area. And uh, you can start to talk about, you can even, when you look at some of these ads, uh, see what programming uh, different groups are buying against. So who's buying against NASCAR, who's buying against Jeopardy or Oprah. Um, and so uh, this can give you also an interesting story on demographics. There's a business angle here too. How much are the TV stations in your market making uh, from these ads? Uh, believe me, in some states that are swing states with big hot Senate races or hot congressional races, um, it's been Christmas every month since uh, 2013. So there's lots of interesting insights you can get from this material. and. Uh, um, and uh, we just hope you'll uh, help us. We would be happy to talk to you if you're interested in uh, ways that we've come up with to get volunteers to help enter the data in different markets. And uh, we're happy to walk you through uh, in more detail how to use this data. So just uh, get in touch with us. Um, I will show you one other thing, how we've used this in the past. Uh, and here is a story um, that we did that was based on this database. Um, one of the things we discovered by tracking political ads is that the political advertising season never, ever ends. And so this is a story uh, that uh, we did uh, because we were looking at advertising um, and noticing that the American Chemistry Council was putting on a lot of ads all over the country for incumbent candidates. And this is an ad that, if you play it, is a very sweet ad about Fred Upton uh, talking about what a wonderful guy he is. He's for family farms, and he believes in jobs for Americans, and he probably likes puppies and kitty cats, too. It never mentions chemistry until the very end, as, and as you can see, you have to be in the room to see it. Uh, it never utters the word chemistry or toxic materials. But Fred Upton happens to be the chairman of the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, which is now considering a rewrite of the Toxic Chemicals Act, which the American Chemistry Council has quite a lobbying interest in. And last year, the American Chemistry Council bought a quarter of a million dollars worth of uh, big wet kiss ads in Fred's district. Um, now, I leave it to you to say whether that is going to affect uh, Fred's actions as chairman of the, uh, of the Energy and Commerce Committee, but we think that's something voters deserve to know. Um, and this is advertising that would not be exposed were it not for this tool, because these are quote unquote issue ads. They never say vote for Fred or vote against Fred. They just say Fred's a great guy. And because they're airing well outside a campaign cycle, they never have to be reported to the Federal Election Commission. But this is the kind of thing you can discover by looking at this database. Questions? Oh, and I think Palmer also had her story that she wanted to show. Um, right, we're going to loop you back to party time because we do it whenever we can. <laughs> um, so let's see, we can, um, one of the cool things that we were able to do um, uh, last year actually was, um, well, on a week, I'm sorry, I should back up. On a weekly basis, we do um, a uh, kind of a roundup of what's happening on the political fundraising scene, which we think is frankly just a good way to um, keep tabs on, on where folks are and, 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 where, when, and what people are doing and who they're hanging out with. So, um, you know, again, uh, we find a lot of, you know, national stories when it involves heavy hitters like uh, President Barack Obama or Vice President Joe Biden doing fundraisers. But then we're able to also find, um, as I mentioned before, that story um, 
about that uh, state senate candidate, Eric Lesser, um, which is down here as well. Um, so we're able to find out that kind of stuff and we kind of explicate and kind of unpack some of these um, some of these invitations and some of the connections that we're able to make with our data. And another, um, and, and that's what we do really just on a weekly basis, again, to just kind of keep tabs on folks. And then um, last year was our birthday. It was our five-year birthday. We turned five. Um, and of course, we had a party to celebrate it. Um, but we also um, did a kind of rundown on, on a lot of different, um, on, on kind of some overall trends and patterns and things um, that we've seen and that we were able to kind of see through, through our data. Um, and um, we were able to look at some, you know, some highlights, you know, what were some particularly um, fabulous, you know, long weekend vacations that people were taking in, you know, Santa Barbara or Miami to do these political fundraisers with lobbyists. Um, we were also able to do this really cool um, map, which I think, um, which is a, a really interesting use of our data. Um, and again, we did this in-house, as you can see, uh, at the Sunlight Foundation. But we did this map of where political fundraisers really happen. And as you can see here, a whole, whole bunch of them happen right in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and happen really, really close to, um, to the Capitol itself. And as I said um, initially, you know, again, kind of anecdotally, we all kind of know, we all kind of have this itching um, instinct that, you know, fund, uh, fundraisers, it makes sense that fundraisers happen uh, down at the Capitol, you know. Um, politicians go and, and do their quick vote or have a meeting at their, at their office on the Hill, and then they're able to go and do a, you know, have a, have a luncheon or a, um, a, you know, happy hour at Johnny's Half Shell, which is about half a block away from the Hill. Um, but we're really able to see it. So, we, so you know, those are things we might kind of know in our gut, but we're able to actually see that using um, taking the data that we compile in, in party time and then able to do a lot of these really fun, um, uh, you know, visualizations and things. And there's sometimes revealing. One of the visualizations we did five years ago showed that um, the biggest party days uh, for politicians are Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, <laughs> uh, which of course is counterintuitive to most of us. But those are the days that Congress is quote unquote working, and uh, and it it does show I think the um, the way that fundraising has become intertwined with. Uh, the lawmakers' business days. So uh, one other funny thing we did is after mapping five years of uh, political parties, uh, over a five-year period, we found that there were only two hours in the 24-hour day that were party-free, and that was like between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. because early in the morning you've got your duck hunts, and uh, we found that duck hunting and fundraising go together, and then late, late night, uh, are the after parties at the convention. So uh, it's really hard to find an hour of the day that you don't have a fundraiser, it turns out. Um, I wanted to show you one other, uh, just two, two more stories that uh, we did um, and before we go to questions, and that is uh, this was off of party time, and this is how sometimes seemingly uh, innocuous and superficial data can turn into something important. Uh, you may remember Senator Olympia Snow, who was celebrated because she was always the swing vote in, in uh, just about every debate in Congress. She retired uh, in the last Congress, and um, she retired and, you know, talked about how this was part something she'd been thinking about for a while, et cetera. And so I looked at party time. And it was interesting, you know, the kind of joke of this story was that uh, Olympia Snow, who everybody, all the, you know, really hard right Republicans thought was a squish, uh, we joked that she was a red meat Republican because she liked to have fundraisers at Charlie Palmer State Steakhouse, which is one of those venues right near the Capitol. But more interestingly, um, she retired in February 2012, and she had been raising money as recently as six weeks before, which kind of suggest to you, hmm, this is a sudden decision. What happened? And so this was a lame little story that uh, I, the artist of the quick turnaround, put up uh, the day that Olympia announced her retirement, and it got my much more talented colleague, uh, Bill Allison, thinking. And five days later, 
we did a much more substantive story um, that was really inspired uh, by uh, us thinking about, gee, Olympia made a, it looks like from party time data that her decision was pretty sudden to retire. What was behind that? And, uh, and it looks like there, were, there was more than just um, what she said was behind the decision. So this is one way that party time data can give you a, interesting little tidbits for a story to contextualize the story, but then possibly can lead you further afield into something uh, much richer and uh, much more um, enterprising. So I just wanted to offer that, too, as an example. Um, and hopefully uh, give you some paths to go down and before we open it up to questions. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kathy and Palmer. Um, I know there are a couple of questions uh, that we received in the chat box. Um, so if you have any other questions, feel free to chat them to us or to uh, unmute your phone by hitting star 7. Uh, so we have uh, about five or six minutes left, and we would be more than happy to take any of your questions. Uh, and we should say we also have here, uh, Jacob Fenton is uh, a reporter and a developer, so if you have any technical questions about these tools, uh, we actually have somebody who's competent to handle that as opposed to yours truly. <laughs> and Jacob, if you want, you can probably summarize a couple of the questions that came through because they seem pretty interesting. Um. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I was talking to uh, somebody, and I think I was actually broadcasting my answers to everyone, which was probably pretty confusing. Um, but the, the point was made that, um, which I think is a good one, is that if you read uh, the, I think, Section 315 of the Communications Act, which dictates what, uh, which, uh, what, what, what things are actually required to go into the broadcast file, um, it seems as if uh, issue ads not run by a candidate targeting a local issue um, are not required to go in this file, and I believe that's correct. But the thing that I want to I want to highlight is that um, there's a whole like stations interpret the rules really differently, and there's a lot of different things going on. Um, you know, I've actually seen lots and lots of local issue ads, um, and you know, in some ways, uh, it, it often is, is sort of more up to the station or. The, uh, or even the ad buyer to sort of nudge the station to either put it in their files or take it out. Um, but in, in cases where we've seen funny things going on, we've, we've written about that. Um, there was a station in Denver that pulled uh, a three-quarter million dollar ad buy. Um, actually, after a, a reporter in, in Colorado uh, noticed that A, the, the buy had just landed, and B, it didn't say even who the ad buyer was or who the advertiser was. Um, and uh, we actually were able to, to, to pull up a copy of that from Google Cash, and we wrote a little bit about that. Um, and you know, I mean, we, 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 what I'd say is that we are, we are caching as many of these documents as we can. Um, if you find uh, stations uh, making these files disappear, uh, give us a call. We may be able to help you. Uh, we, we, we may not be, too. But um, you know, it's, it's really a new thing uh, for, for all of the stations to be doing this. The stations and the top, fi the, the top four affiliates uh, top four market affiliates in the top 50 stations have been doing this for a few years, and they kind of have their routines figured out. But smaller stations haven't had to think about it, and you will see all sorts of weird things in there. Um, I, I've actually seen uh, one of the stations has included, you know, uh, ratings for all of their shows and the gross ratings points um, of of all of the ad spots purchased, which is the kind of commercial information that, in theory, stations are very protective of, uh, and and ad buyers can really interpret for you. Um, but, you know, that's the sort of thing that we just have kind of um, found by looking. Uh, so what I'd say is that there's a lot of different things in here. Um, the other thing I'd say, too, is that a lot of states, you'll often find a terms and conditions folder uh, or, or, or documents labeled terms and conditions. And TV stations will, will often, you know, have like four pages or six pages of uh, kind of detailed information about how they handle political ads. And that, that's really useful background uh, for you um, to, to understand uh, how this stuff works. Um, and there was another question by uh, Daniel uh, wondering if we aggregate that information um, on the political ads, uh, on other political ads on the, on the fundraisers. And I just uh, pulled up a, a profile here of um, Cochrane uh, in Influence Explorer. And we are pulling in this information uh, for the uh, party time and the fundraisers uh, into this other tool that, that we have. So um, 
to but, get. But we do not yet have the uh, ad data in there. That's something you would have to look for. Right, but we have the um, the fundraiser data. So I wasn't sure which you were which one you were referencing. Um, but you can see that it's taking a little bit to load. But if you are in Influence Explorer for each of the politicians that we have that uh, party time data, we will add it to their profile page. Are there any other questions? Um. One of the other things I should point out is that, that both of these sites have APIs, um, so not just Party Time, but also AdSleuth, um, uh, that, that can be a little bit hard to find, but is, is uh, useful for developing tools or just you know analyzing this data um, in more detail than what you get just by eyeballing the site. Um, and, and we're happy to uh, talk with anyone by email or over my phone. And can you on. talk about the, um if folks want to follow a particular politician or set of politicians, uh, it, at least in, I think we should talk, uh, maybe show the, um, the download, the CSV download on AdSleuth and then also on uh, Party Time uh, if people want to follow a politician. Yeah, um, on, on AdSleuth um, we offer alerting at the market level um, because we don't really know who outside who non-candidate non uh, advertising is targeting, um, instead of trying to figure that out, we just offer a, a, a alert that's based on the entire market. That's sort of often the way that, what the, I, I think that's the most useful thing to get. So every time a new file appears in that market, you'll get an email or, well, you can set it up so that you can get an email. You can restrict it so you don't get a gazillion emails and you just get one a day. Um, and uh, I'm going to show that on our site. So I've called up, um, uh, the Las Vegas market, and uh, you can see at the top that you can subscribe to an RSS feed or create an alert uh, for this particular market. Right, and that page also, if you look in the lower right of the, where the page is now, there's a, a button that says download CSV of all files. Um, that is uh, where we have summary information of all the files uh, that includes the, the ad buy amounts when entered. Um, uh, we're going to have a few more detailed files just to break things down by, by markets because folks have been asking us for that. Um, right now that's a file of I think 120,000 um, ads or something like that. Um, but but that once you cool. download it, even on my tiny little computer, I've been able to download it and you can, um, uh, you can you know, obviously filter for your market or filter for a particular advertiser. So even the CSV uh, that we have now, which as Jacob said, is kind of big, but you can make it, you can tailor it to, to fit your needs. Um, so it looks like we are just about out of time. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for joining us for the webinar today. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, this is the second part of a three-part uh, training series we have with INN. And you can um, uh, register for our next webinar at training.sunlightfoundation.com slash events. Uh, and I'm sharing that link right now. And um, I'm also going to see if I can show you my, my web browser. I think I'm having issues with this. But uh, the next one is going to be on APIs and data sets for your uh, newsroom uh, as something that Jacob alluded to earlier. All of our data that you have seen here today uh, has either bulk data or has APIs. Uh, so really I encourage you all to join us um, next week, uh, next Tuesday uh, for that uh, webinar if you're interested in uh, the data elements of all of this information that we have. And please, please, please feel free to contact us if you have thoughts about these tools, if you have ideas, if you are just tearing your hair out and can't remember what we said. We also provide uh, resources on training at training.sunlightfoundation.com uh, so you can go back and look at it. But we, uh, we are happy to talk to folks who are using our tools and uh, help you to get stories from them. And I will also say we're happy to receive uh, fundraiser invites from anyone out there. So please go ahead and, and send them um, to us either by uploading them or by emailing us at um, emailing. You can email me directly if you want to, pgibbs at sunlightfoundation.com or at our party time. And address. hit up your sources for those invitations. <laughs> ask, ask, ask. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and we'll see you next week.